Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the National Hispanic Medical Association Cultural Competence and Future of the Healthcare Workforce webinar. My name is Dr. Ashonda St. John. I'm the chair of the OBGYN department at Health Alliance Hospitals of the Hudson Valley, which is part of the Westchester Medical Center Network, and also a 2022 National Hispanic Medical Association Leadership Fellow. I will be serving as the moderator for today's event. To give a brief introduction, the National Hispanic Medical Association is a nonprofit association representing the interests of nearly 50,000 licensed Hispanic physicians across the United States. The National Hispanic Medical Association's mission is to empower Hispanic physicians to lead efforts to improve the health of Hispanics and other underserved populations in collaboration with Hispanic state medical societies, residents, medical students, and other public and private sector partners. Today, we are joined by Dr. Pilar Ortega, Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education. We also have Dr. Winston Wong, Chair and Acting CEO of the National Council of Asian Pacific Islander Physicians and Alliance of Multicultural Physicians. And we also have Dr. Francisco Moreno, Associate Vice President at the, United, at the University of Arizona Health Science Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. We hope that our conversation today can address the importance of quality of care and the importance of cultural humility and awareness in the medical education system. Panelists will discuss how curriculum and programs focus on understanding cultural backgrounds of patients and the community can engage patients more effectively and provide solutions towards accessible quality care. Ultimately, our discussion today aims to highlight the importance of cultural competence education and treatment of our patients in our communities. Now, as a reminder, should any questions occur during today's event, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A box and we will gladly address them during our Q&A discussion session. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Pilar Ortega, to Prevent, present her first uh, presentation. So thank you, Dr. Ortega. Thank you so much, Dr. St. John, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the invitation from the National Hispanic Medical Association, an organization of which I've been proudly a part since I was a medical student. So it's wonderful to be here in this context now, uh, specifically to talk about cultural competence in graduate medical education as you know, from my uh, perspective at this point at the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, um, I would like to share with you all, um, go ahead, next slide, please. Um, some of uh, the key items uh, in which the ACGME's uh, mission um, has moved forward in um, addressing uh, the issues that uh, are so relevant uh, today. Uh, so first, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of the ACGME and our mission. Uh, the mission is to improve healthcare and population health by assessing and enhancing the quality of resident and fellow physicians' education through accreditation and education. Uh, so as many of you know, uh, the ACGME accredits all of the residency and fellowship programs in the United States. Next. And one of the uh, core areas uh, that the ACGME has been uh, addressing, uh, especially and in more explicit fashion uh, since the past four years when our Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion was first initiated, has been um, these foundational principles. Uh, so I wanna share with you how we contextualize the work in diversity, equity and inclusion because I think that's really important to understanding 
uh, what cultural competence um, has to do with medical education at the graduate uh, trainee level. So first of all, healthcare disparities have to be viewed and understood as a deficiency in healthcare quality. Health equity is a means to achieve the elimination of healthcare disparities. And we want to increase workforce diversity because that is a way that we can achieve improvements in health and healthcare equity. And then finally, inclusion is a tool to ensure that diversity is successful. Next. I want to share a little bit of data that forms the background as to what ACGME um, is aiming to do in this area. Uh, there are high odds, about 20 times the odds, that a Black, Latinx, or Asian American physician will disproportionately see a patient of their same race, ethnicity, or language. This tells us that patients choose concordant care. Next. However, we cannot only depend on racially, ethnically, and linguistically concordant care to eliminate healthcare disparities. One of the reasons for this is that the percentage of historically marginalized physicians trained in the United States has not changed appreciably in over 15 years. Next. So we at ACGME are um, very uh, interested in helping programs and sponsoring institutions understand what strategies have been successful at different programs and what strategies they may be able to use to enhance health equity. And that should include increasing and supporting physician workforce diversity, inclusion and belonging, as well as training all physicians to care for diverse populations, including cultural competence and humility. Next. So as I shared previously, um, our uh, organization uh, created an Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion to address these issues directly in GME. Um, there is also a revision to the mission and vision statements of the organization and uh, we also modified the common program requirements to address diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next. In particular, uh, common program requirement 1C states that programs, GME programs, in partnership with sponsoring institutions must engage in practices that focus on mission-driven, ongoing, systematic recruitment and retention of a diverse workforce. And this is really the core of the accreditation requirement uh, that I wanted to share with you today. Next. And you may be um, familiar with um, the um, recent issues and impact in your own uh, institutions and in your own work regarding the Supreme Court decision um, regarding affirmative action. Um, from the standpoint of graduate medical education, um, we um, have shared some uh, statements uh, regarding uh, how uh, this decision affects um, graduate medical education. And the main message is that the decision should not impact how we select or train resident physicians. The ACGME's requirements for graduate medical education programs and for sponsoring institutions have not changed because the guiding principle for ACGME's requirements is ensuring that our training programs can prepare physicians to care for our patient population. Next. So the bottom line is that we need to be able to identify and uh, select uh, physicians who have the skills and help them train in the skills that can benefit patient care and population health. Next. One example of those skills um, is language. So when we look at the language profile of US residency applicants, I wanted to point out, uh, given that our, this webinar today is the National Hispanic Medical Association, that among Latino identifying resident physicians, 91% of them uh, 
self-report having skills at an advanced level or higher in a non-English language, which for the most part is Spanish. Next. So um, with that, um, I wanna share a few opportunities um, that we have at ACGME to enhance work in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we can talk more about these as we go in our conversation later on. Um, we have uh, learning opportunities through the ACGME's Equity Matters Foundational uh, curriculum uh, of, for which there are a number of videos next as well as toolkits and a learning community that people can join and be a part of. Uh, this tool that I'm sharing here on the screen now um, is an example of um, one of the um, learning modules. Uh, module number nine is being featured here because um, we are about to embark in uh, Hispanic Heritage Month and includes um, a module about individuals who identify as Latino, Hispanic, uh, and of Spanish origin. Um, and like this one, there are over 35 foundational videos um, that people can watch and learn and access freely um, after um, uh, signing in uh, for an account at our Learn at ACGME site. Next. We also want to be able to disseminate strategies that programs may have used that have been effective, uh, for example, in cultural competency curricula. Uh, so if you have strategies that you would like to share, um, we would be uh, very happy to share those with others. Next. And an example of what we are doing with that is we are building a resource collection that is not yet available, but is currently being built, um, including information and uh, approaches to enhancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in each of the areas listed here. So including pathway initiatives, recruitment, retention, and others. Next. We also want to invite uh, people to join us for uh, supportive environments in which they can share uh, challenges as well as successes that they're experiencing. And we have a monthly call called the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officers Forum, and we would be very happy to have others join us in those monthly sessions. Next. And finally, um, we have an opportunity to be recognized uh, for work that you are doing in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next. We um, have named this award uh, for Dr. Ross Lee, the first African-American woman to serve as Dean of a US medical school. And it really is meant to highlight excellence and innovation in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, so please be on the lookout for that opportunity uh, coming soon uh, for next year's award. Next. Uh, that is uh, all of the um, data and information that I wanted to share with you in these uh, initial comments, and I look forward to our conversation uh, with our other panelists. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortega, and thank you for just really talking about all the work the ACGME is doing in the field of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are so grateful. Um, now I want to bring forth our next speaker for his presentation, and that is Dr. Winston Wong, our Chair and Acting CEO of the National Council of Asian Pacific Islander Physician and Alliance of Multicultural Physicians. Dr. Wong, thank you so much. Take it away. Yeah, thank you, Dr. St. John. I'm, I'm so honored to be um, one of the panelists with this great group of uh, subject matter experts as well as champions around health equity and diversity. Um, and I, I wanted just to pause here um, to mention the Alliance for Multicultural Physicians. I'm actually one member of the executive committee and the National Hispanic Medical Association and the Association of American Indian Physicians uh, are, are other sister organizations that form the Alliance for Multicultural Physicians and also in close support with the National Medical Association and the Association of Black Cardiologists. So that's something to celebrate very much uh, in, in tune with what we are covering today with regards to diversity and looking at the issues of cultural humility. Um, so I'm sharing this slide with you. Uh, first off, it reminds me of a story that I want to share with you. 
Uh, I used to be a federal health official, and one of my responsibilities was to evaluate various uh, community health center programs across a fairly large geographic um, footprint. And um, fortunately, one of the areas that I was covering was Hawaii. And I do recall going to uh, a community health center to evaluate their mental health services program because the federal government had asked me to kind of look at uh, what the program was uh, uh, doing and how it was performing on certain metrics. And a very, very interesting story because it reminds me uh, when I see this photograph of this gentleman, uh, I sat down with the um, director of mental health services program and he, he said, uh, Dr. Wong, let me bring you to my garden uh, in the back here of the clinic. And in the garden, he sat down with me and he started just uh, chopping sugar cane and um, really just uh, getting to the core of the sugar cane. And he said, you know, we have people come in here and they really enjoy the garden. And, you know, we, 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 we think this garden is a community resource uh, and we think it's very beautiful and it's representative of our community's association with the land and what the islands mean to us. And I looked at him and I said, well, that's really great, doctor. But I was really here to evaluate the mental health program. And then he struck me and he says, well, actually, you're living the mental health program as we speak. Um, and it really taught me right there about how much my journey around cultural humility needed to still continue because he pointed out to me, our mental health program here on the islands with Native Hawaiians is not for me to bring in a patient and sit in a room and have that person just uh, sit down or lie down as it is and tell me about their problems. It is about really the social interaction and the trust building that occurs and the relationship of our people to the land that enables them to be able to really talk about emotional behavioral issues that impact them. So I thought that was a very telling um, lesson, um, something that I think all of the panelists could probably relate to, to and carry on. Can we have the next slide? Um, like some of you um, probably, you began your career at a community health center. This is in Oakland, Chinatown. And um, here I am as a busy young physician uh, struggling with electronic health record, uh, but also asking myself at the end of every day, how did I really help my patients today? And knowing well that I got trained by, you know, some of the top medical institutions in the country, uh, how did it really translate that figuratively and concretely in terms of caring for the patients that I saw in Oakland Chinatown? who were mainly immigrant, who were low income, and who speak languages other than English and have various uh, economic uh, challenges and challenges in terms of accessing mainstream healthcare. I think those are the lessons in which we draw through in terms of what's the thread of looking at how to be a culturally humble and competent, or at least a, a, in tune with our uh, multi-diverse uh, uh, communities. Next slide. So now, some of you are probably familiar with the uh, concept of social determinants of health, of which we can see here. And we know that social determinants of health or social influencers of health probably in the aggregate represent about 67% of the actual um, reasons why we have good health or bad health. And you can see here along the wheel all the different issues that contribute to those social determinants or social influencers. But on the right side, I would just want to remind folks that even as we understand, understand social influencers of health, we also have to consider uh, across diverse populations that there are language barriers and cultural beliefs that impact how people think about their gender, for example, or how they think about their physical environment. This whole issue with regards to doctor-patient communication uh, I understood as I started to become a primary care physician how difficult that can be in terms of assumptions. So I, I recall many conversations that I had with patients and I would be asking them, well, you're the patient, you're the boss, you need to tell me 
what um, what you really would like to do. And they would look at me blankly and they said, but you're the doctor. You need to tell me what to do. And I kind of struggled with that in any individual circumstance to try to reconcile and balance expectations of where various patients and their cultural background weighed in and how I had to be able to be responsible and respectful enough to understand that they had different uh, understandings of how communication occurred or what the role of physician caretaker is to uh, a patient. And of course, you know that there's a lot less familiarity with the U.S. healthcare system um, uh, among immigrants and people who are new to our communities. Uh, you know, I think some of you know that some certain patients expect that you come in and you get a, a shot or a medication as opposed to a more protracted kind of prolonged primary care kind of relationship. And I don't make judgments on that. I just understand that people do have different contexts in which to understand how healthcare and medicine is practiced across uh, different settings. I myself now are, am um, being the kind of navigator for my 94 year old mother who's dealing with some health problems. And even though she's been in the United States for 75 years, and I'm a physician, uh, and she is uh, you know, quite sophisticated in her own way, I've learned that the navigation across our healthcare delivery system is far from patient-centered. And there are many obstacles, including language and culture, that have to be incorporated into having productive uh, patient-physician and healthcare um, encounters. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Ortega kind of had a different perspective, uh, well, a different uh, slide to kind of uh, add it to the same point here is that uh, we know that physicians of color of different ethnicities have a, a, a more of a, uh, they have a disproportionate opportunity to see patients of, of uh, communities of color. Uh, and that's only going to be even more magnified over the ensuing decades, as you can see here. And we all know this, that really within the next one generation, two generations, the majority of patients that we'll see will be coming from uh, different um, communities of color and different immigrant communities. And uh, me as a Chinese American, uh, Asian American physician, I certainly know the importance of caring for communities other than Asian Pacific Islander communities, caring for uh, Spanish speaking communities and caring for black patients, caring for Native American patients. And this really needs to be part of the armamentarium of basically every physician, whether they come from that specific community, community organically or they're serving that community. So this is going to be a, a, a critical part of how our healthcare a system is, uh, is uh, uh, designed to meet the needs of our country. Next slide. Um, having said that, when we look at any individual, uh, I think we need to remind ourselves that there's so many factors that come into play. I mentioned social factors, social determinants, social influencers, but in terms of people's background, if we see a patient, the first thing we might go through our uh, thinking process is consider their age and gender, race, their physical ability. But there's so many other aspects under the iceberg, as this slide uh, attempts to say, in including their family status, including their immigration status, including whether they're documented, including whether uh, they have issues with regards to family fragmentation. Uh, maybe they have uh, parts of their families that are, are refugees, part of their families still in the old country. These are all part of the composite of how individuals uh, relate to us as physicians and relate to us as healthcare deliverers. And it behooves us to spend some time to go beneath the top of the iceberg and understand how these different components really impact how we can best serve our patients. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I think concretely, uh, when we look at the cultural values that are pretty much uh, displayed or uh, 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 exemplified in every encounter, is to look how an individual uh, deals with resiliency, how they see their family structure, how they deal with just the issues of food on the table, uh, their faith and their religion, 
how they think about fatalism when they're confronting uh, really critical uh, health issues and how, as I mentioned early, how they view medical authority. Concretely, I think this is how issues around cultural navigation and cultural humility are navigated. These are all interrelated. So with regards to faith, it has a lot to do of how we think about fatalism. And medical authority has a lot to do of how we relate to the family structure. I think this is how it's actually manifested in every encounter. I think the next slide will kind of wrap up my initial comments. I think for all of, of, of physicians that are in training or younger in your career, these are some of the concrete suggestions I would have for you. You need to ask open-ended questions and don't have pre-made and pre-formulated assumptions about uh, what the answers are going to be or what how you frame those questions. Language needs are pretty obvious. Um, I've resisted being the interpreter for my mother, but I know it comes up, but we need to be able to seek assistance from trained interpreters if we feel that we're, uh, we're out of our, our water. Uh, we need to understand the role of religion and family, really understand that particular family circumstances. Uh, and we have to also consider that periods of silence are good and live with silence and live with people just contemplating what are the consequences of something that we're explaining to them that can be very uh, difficult to understand and to assimilate. We have to think about health literacy in that re in respect as well. A lot of the terms that we use in medicine are not necessarily easily translated in other different languages. We have to be attentive to nonverbal clues and be observant and not just turn our head to the computer and put in things into an electronic health record. Uh, the nonverbal cues and the eye contact are as critical in any aspect of communication as much as the words that we actually use. And we have to address immediate needs and give concrete advice. I think people are really looking for suggestions uh, as they come up to navigate a particular episode or incident and um, pro be provided some assurance. And finally, provide clear and full information and recognize there's always an opportunity to loop back to individuals and to families and ask if they have any more questions and if we can be much more supportive and uh, productive uh, for their encounters. Uh, one last thing before uh, I'll, I'll close my comments. I always ask uh, medical students, why do you think patients come to see us? And people say, oh, you know, they want to know the diagnosis or um, you know, they, they want to know what medications to use. But I think fundamentally, we have to recognize that patients come to us for three things. They come to us because they want to be either relieved of pain because they're having a lot of pain. Number two, they have fear. Uh, they're fearful of something bad or fearful that they miss something. And number three, they're seeking comfort. Uh, comfort for their family, a comfort for themselves, physical comfort, emotional comfort. So those are the core issues that we have to deal with as physicians and how we deal that with deal with that in a responsible, a responsible way with our faux composite of being uh, culturally humble, I think is key in terms of being really effective care providers. I think those are the um, initial slides that I want to share. Thank you. Dr. Wong, thank you for that presentation, but also that very important discussion on cultural humility, mental health, wellness, but social interactions. I think those very valuable tools and, and clinical pearls that you gave will help so many, but also provide a better quality of care that our patients deserve. Um, so thank you. Um, next, I would like to introduce Dr. Francisco Moreno. He is our Associate Vice President at the University of Arizona Health Science Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Dr. Moreno, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Dr. St. John, for the introduction. And uh, it's an honor to be here with, uh, with my colleagues. It's an honor to be sharing the space with all of you in the audience that are spending part of your evening with us. And uh, I hope that we are going to be sharing with you uh, some information that can help us be focused, energized, and of course committed to addressing the needs of our community members, which is what we're all about. 
Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Elena Rios, to Christopher, to Jason for their help at uh, organizing this event as well. Uh, let's see the next slide, please. Okay, so very briefly, I'd like to start with the land acknowledgement, which is uh, a very important uh, grounding uh, experience that um, uh, in the University of Arizona, we often start by talking about how our university is set in the lands and territories of indigenous people, the Pasquayaki and the uh, Tono Otham Nation. I have had the honor of serving as a provider of psychiatric services to both of these uh, tribes to live and interact with their people and serve their needs, as well as the Hispanic community. Uh, the map shows that about a quarter of the territory of our state is in native lands, and much of the uh, the, the lands owned by the University of Arizona, of course, were part of a land-grant institution, and we have a commitment to serve the needs of disadvantaged communities in addition to the native communities, and we are a Hispanic-serving institution and very proud of, of having a very uh, important commitment to, to addressing the needs of our Hispanic uh, community as well. Let's, let's see the next slide, please. So um, we'll be talking a little bit about workforce uh, diversity, and I always like this idea of starting with why. I do not know if you all can see my cursor here, but um, I'm trying to kind of uh, point in the direction of that little target looking like thing uh, to the right side of the screen where um, Simon Sinek uh, ha uh, written this book talking about how do we start with why. Um, and it, looking at this uh, slide, we see here in the darker blue, uh, the proportion of individuals from the various um, racial ethnic groups in the state of Arizona. And we see uh, whites coming up at a little bit over 50%. Um, and then uh, Latinos being here at about 30%. This is uh, from the previous census. So um, these numbers are slightly, uh, greater in terms of a couple of points percentage of increased representations of Latinos. Uh, but it's the closest that we have to getting an opportunity to see the proportion of pharmacists, physicians, nurses, public health practitioners and, and in our state. And we could see, for example, uh, physicians um, being in the yellow, we have a greater proportion of physicians in the white uh, community compared to the darker blue line. However, in the Hispanic, we have uh, almost 30 plus percent of uh, uh, members of our community that are Hispanic and the yellow part is way less than 10%. So we are six point something in the state. A very dramatic disparity, right? It's about um, 400 plus percent need of growth for us to catch up with parity in terms of the proportion of folks that we treat. And so, of course, we like to increase the diversity of the various populations, uh, particularly those that are most um, underrepresented, but also work with everybody to make sure that we're all able to serve the needs of all individuals. And that is an important priority for us. Uh, today, we'll talk a little bit about diversifying the pipeline, uh, not only by working with individuals from uh, racial, ethnic, diverse backgrounds, but also working with people from economically and educationally disadvantaged uh, rural areas and border areas as well. Let's see the next slide, please. Um, so um, I apologize for the formatting getting, getting a little strange here, but um, a couple of the points that we identify as priorities for us. Uh, we work uh, doing outreach. Uh, outreach uh, basically means we uh, make every effort to connect with the members of the communities that we believe we must support to be better represented. We want to meet them where they're at, help them believe that they could actually be one of our health providers, and make them feel invited as well. Uh, that is um, uh, very important in the sense that uh, many of us uh, from uh, different backgrounds that have not been very well represented we don't feel like insiders. We don't feel like we belong. And sometimes people need to tap us and tell us, hey, you know, you, you can do this thing or you should do this thing. We don't always have the role models. We don't always come from the uh, educational backgrounds that are uh, prepping us up to seeing ourselves as those individuals. So again, reaching 
Um, also, as a medical school, uh, medical schools in our case, we we want to be advertising our mission, right? It's not just about come to the University of Arizona because we would like to have you person from X background, but rather talking about our commitment to addressing equity um, and uh, making it very clear, but also making it authentic. Um, you know, I would always caution partners and others to really try to promote diversity and bring people in if we're not really committed to serving their needs. You don't want to kind of trap people into a place because you want to have diversity. You want to bring them in and you want to foster them to be successful uh, by being part of an environment that is really being developed, if it's not already there, to really um, provide the needs that people need in a in a um, in a um, in an ecosystem that is really um, going to round them up with uh, every aspect of their experience being supportive. Um, we want to work with them to increase their competitiveness and uh, um, empower them so that they can feel and be successful. Uh, and this is not a thing that we do by virtue of having one visit or coming to their school once, but rather uh, connecting with them and having a personal relationship with them and helping groom them and engage with them and keep them connected with us longitudinally so that we can see and, and ensure that this is part of what's going on. Uh, we talk about relationship building again. Uh, this is about uh, making people feel like insiders, relationally and physically. They need to have you on speed dial. They need to be able to email you and be a little irreverent and, hey, Francisco, you know, what about this and that and the other? And we need to be available to respond and hook them up and connect them with the rest of the members of our team that are going to allow us to touch a lot of people. Uh, let's see the next slide, please. Uh, examples of some of these programs have been uh, extended to our community members with support from uh, HRSA uh, funding, as well as the Area Health Education Centers. We partner very closely with the Arizona uh, Area Health Education Centers. Um, you know, we have a great team of folks internally, but uh, Arizona is huge. You know, our territory is like very large. You see how rural we are. We have a lot of reservations, a lot of border area. And we have a lot of school districts that we cannot reach without the partnership of other folks. So we subcontract with uh, members of the AHICS so that we can be able to be at uh, all the high schools in the disadvantaged areas that we can uh, provide uh, curricular support to provide financial support for the HOSA clubs, the JTED clubs, and others that are having an interest in, in promoting a health career exploration. Um, and uh, some of the things that we offer, let's see the next slide, please, are programs like uh, longitudinal sort of mentorship programs, such as the AZ Hope Ambassadors. Uh, for individuals that are in high school, we've had this 50-year-old MedStar Health Careers Program. We bring uh, close to 50 individuals each year to the campus of the University of Arizona. You know, it's a very important experience to be physically present where they will anticipate they may be training. And it's not that we want to have people train so that they can come to the U of A, but it's, a, it's their opportunity to be in their public state institution and have a, a university type experience where they get exposed to a lot of health professionals. And, uh, you know, we support their learning skills and things of that nature. We also work with Bridge, which is um, folks that are um, adult non-traditional learners and other folks from disadvantaged backgrounds that are being transferred into the university. Uh, to secure a soft landing and good connection. They take some coursework uh, that uh, helps them with successful uh, skills um, and whatnot. We have Blazer and Frontera program. Uh, these are internship, 10 week type of internships for undergraduate and some recent graduates as well that are looking to advance to health profession careers like medical school. If people come to Frontera, we'll They'll be doing uh, research in the border area and they'll be doing MCAT preparation. They'll be working with researchers, presenting abstracts, sometimes publishing things together and getting some letters of recommendations from some of these folks that they spend a summer with. Blazer is uh, a little bit more basic-y in terms of the kind of work that we're doing with them. 
Uh, we do more uh, GRE preparation. Also, folks that may be interested in in uh, in more uh, CTSA type of research as well. And again, this is an opportunity to spend a lot of time with folks. We have 120 plus people each summer that are spending six to 10 weeks with us. And many of these folks are working with us longitudinally. So this is one way in which we concretely help them prepare uh, for competitive development uh, so that they can um, be applying and succeeding in medical school and other health professions. Let's see the next slide, please. I'll be a little bit more brief uh, so that we can have more time for discussion. I had talked about supporting an ecology for comprehensive inclusion. And that basically means we need to have the buy-in of not only an office of diversity and a group of champions that support diversity, but it has to be institution-wide. It needs to be all of the leadership and it needs to be everyone believing that this is an essential function for us so that these people are going to be welcome. Uh, but they also need to be seeing themselves in some of the folks that are in there. So we need to have uh, engaged uh, faculty and staff members from backgrounds similar to theirs. Um, and we need to be creating an environment in which they're able to bring their whole self uh, into the place and not feel awkward. They're validated, they're affirmed uh, in their identities. And uh, we... Um, uh, we do a lot of, uh, uh, we go through a lot of efforts to make sure that we promote a sense of belonging uh, by these individuals as well. Uh, let's see the next slide, please. Um, once they're with us, we also uh, work very hard to make sure that we have this whole community model. It's like a whole health model that this CDC really proposes for, for school uh, age children. We do it for our students as well. Uh, making sure that they're perceiving to be uh, expert learners. We teach them to, to be, we have two learning specialists in our office that are working on one-on-ones with folks. Um, and we uh, are really working with uh, mentoring and modeling with them to address uh, uh, stereotype threat and other uh, challenging issues. We have a full-time counselor uh, at the health sciences to work with individuals from uh, uh, disadvantaged backgrounds and we do screening, but we also do wellness uh, uh, interventions and counseling as well. Um, we know that this has been a major challenge in our uh, members of the diverse communities that are most disadvantaged, first generation students, uh, students that are Pell Grant recipients are a lot more likely to require and benefit from behavioral health type interventions. And so this, this is something that we, we practice uh, uh, very uh, actively. The colleges of medicine have a lot of resources dedicated for the students that are already enrolled in the programs to provide behavioral health interventions as well. Let's do the next slide, please. This is the last one that I'll be saying. And so many times people come to medical school, they're excited, they have a lot of ideas of things they want to be doing. And then once they come to medical school, there's so many other things that we get very excited about. Now we discover this fantastic surgery and, and this types of research and whatnot, but we need to make sure that we continue to promote and foster and affirm that identity and service aspiration that folks have when they come in. So we've worked to modify the curriculum uh, to create experiences that are curricular and extracurricular uh, to foster that uh, sense of belonging. And we have four distinction tracks that are designed for individuals to be working exclusively with uh, rural health, with uh, border health, with um, community service, uh, providing service to the underserved. We have a distinction track for uh, bilingual medical Spanish as well, and global health, which is not just, you know, where in the world do you want to go, but what low income country do you want to go serve that where you can be bringing some expertise and also learning how you're going to be doing this service within our communities in Arizona and the rest of the states, as well as being a good global uh, justice citizen uh, going forward afterwards. So uh, these are just examples of, of how we must continue to have this sort of comprehensive uh, holistic uh, uh, setting that allows individuals to continue uh, that commitment to the service that we uh, brought him in with uh, at the beginning. So with that, I think I'm going to stop here and maybe create an opportunity for, 
for our colleagues to, uh, and I to talk a little bit more as a panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Moreno. Um, I think it's so important to understand what you have kind of created there in terms of not only diversifying the pipeline, but also building the pipeline and starting with feeling invited, but marrying wellness and counseling and modeling to mentorship. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I think we're limited on time, so I want to jump into one of our first questions and, you know, hear back from our panelists. So I'm going to start with Dr. Moreno. Um, what are some challenges faced by students of unrepresented backgrounds in medical schools that might present as inequities in their education? So, um, I, I can speak about Arizona with a lot of certainty. And uh, I believe this applies to many other parts in our country as well. Uh, but in the state of Arizona, individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds, like uh, African American, Native Americans, uh, Hispanic as well, uh, immigrants from a variety of different countries, um, you know, Filipino, Vietnamese, you name it, um, they, there's, um, they're often in uh, school districts that are underperforming. Uh, they uh, they may be stars within their classroom and within their class. However, the the um, the quality of experience that they will be receiving at their institution uh, may not be up to par with that of other folks that are coming in very competitively ready to apply for medical schools. And so, um, very frequently, you find that uh, we have not had the experience of uh, comfort with reading, the comfort with excelling, the comfort with participating in research, and really expanding our educational experience beyond what is brought in in the common curriculum uh, when you're living in an underperforming district. Um, many times we don't have the role models also, and uh, folks in our in our community that that have uh, uh, foster a lot of the habits and and uh, allowed us to also know um, other um, uh, I would say hidden curriculum type of experiences as we go through school. So I'm going to stop there. Thanks so much, Dr. Moreno. You know, I want to just kind of kind of point this next question to Dr. Wong. You know, Dr. Wong, you spoke so much about cultural humility, but also kind of understanding the intersectionality of cultural values and cultural humility, but also thinking about comfort and kind of the relationship that you've had in terms of how did I help my patient today? So what I wanna say is what are some ways in which educators can implement cultural responsive programs that can help students increase their social awareness or the intersection attributes of healthcare? Would you mind answering that for us? Uh, sure, I'll take a shot at it. And I think uh, Dr. Moreno really provided some important contextual comments on that in that I think number one, students need to feel like they are welcome and a faculty themselves then have to be very conscious with regards to um, being actually somewhat vulnerable and transparent in terms of what they come as, as individuals. Because each of us come with a, a background that is relevant and important in terms of why we pursued medicine. And I think too many times, many faculty or many senior physicians feel that that's nothing, that's something they can't share or that's something that they don't feel comfortable sharing. And dare say there's some elitism that's involved, I think, in some of the mainstream uh, folks that have been involved in this to try to maintain some distance between themselves and their students. I think it's important for mm -hmm. faculty and senior physicians to uh, be able to acknowledge the struggles that all of us have to put up with, the imposter syndrome, the issues with regards to feeling out of place, whether that be because of our language or for our ethnicity or because of any other issues. And that I think establishes a, a, a place of trust. And that's the basis in which we start to have real relationships with our patients. Because I, I have found the most gratifying relationships with patients is when they can 
readily relate to me and vice versa. Because in my case, I was able to share the fact that my parents were immigrants and they came from a certain part of the old country and immediately could see the eyes of my patients light up. And they said, you're from that part of the country and you speak our language, our dialogue. And it just made those healing relationships not only more productive, but truly much more gratifying. And uh, it's preventive with regards to burnout because I think we developed those relationships. So um, probably a longer answer than you were seeking, but the only way that we can become uh, culturally humble and, and bring that cultural humility is to uh, acknowledge our own vulnerability and our ability and our willingness to be learners as much as teachers. I'd like to follow up on that, if I could, Dr. St. John. Um, I, I really think. Uh, I really think that uh, Dr. Wong uh, hit the nail on the head there, and um, I would like to add to it. Um, I think, in terms of how we can be culturally responsive, we really need to be uh, following the learner, and we need to be following. The patient. Um, that means um, we need to be able to learn from them. We need to recognize when we as the physician doesn't have all the answers. That is essentially the essence of cultural humility, um, that we follow the values and the cultural uh, practices and um, preferences that our patients and also our students come to us with. So if we go with that framework of following the learner, following the patient, that I think can be a really um, strong basis for then developing curricula that follow the learner, that meet them where they are, and that then expands on it. And also viewing the learner as a teacher, right? As somebody who can bring to us something that valuable from their community. And I think that's where um, I think we need to switch a little bit. Our tendency is to have a deficit uh, mindset when it comes to individuals who are different from us. Uh, we need to switch that and we need to switch that into an asset-based framework where we can see that people, what they're bringing to us has a value, has a value because it is different. It has a value because they know something that I don't. Um, so I think doing that uh, in general, both with patient care as well as with um, education is really critical. I would just add one more thing, Dr. St. John. I, I love Dr. Ortega's remarks. One concrete thing is I, I would recommend that every student and every faculty member uh, really get some training in, in implicit bias uh, because I think it re re really is enlightening for us to understand uh, how we bring that to the table and how it, uh, it it's harmful sometimes if we don't recognize our implicit bias. Thank you both. I think that one of the profound things Dr. Ortega said is recogni recognizing the value in our differences. So, so, so powerful statement. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question, and I'm just going to open this up, and whoever wants to jump in and answer that would be wonderful. Why is it important? Why improving cultural competence and awareness in medical schools important when discussing barriers found in increasing healthcare workforces? So this is going back to our pipelines and how are we getting more um, providers um, into our healthcare workforce? So please, anyone jump in. Well, I can start um, by by saying that I think uh, it really ties into what we were just discussing in terms of this asset based framework, because I think once we structure our uh, curricula and provide uh, training and identify as a goal that we want our physicians and our future physicians to be culturally competent and culturally humble, once we identify that as a goal, then um, suddenly we're going to be more attractive as a field to individuals who are coming from backgrounds that are different because they're going to see this is something that is valued. I bring something to the table. So they see they can see themselves um, doing that 
doing that, learning that, excelling in it. And so I think that that switch in our in our own mindset as um, people who are oftentimes in charge of selecting candidates, in charge of interviewing them, in charge of um, deciding, you know, what makes it to the curriculum or not. I know schools are often very um, restricted in terms of time and, and what lectures and what uh, workshops and what educational opportunities can be offered or not uh, because there is or isn't time for them. So we need to prioritize those things that are actually gonna make an impact in terms of people being able to provide the care we want them to provide to the population. Um, and that's why it is, uh, in my view, um, so critical that we do that. I think it is going to be a cycle that once we do prioritize that, we are going to see an increase in not only everybody's ability to take care of all patients, but also we will probably see more interest from applicants who come from diverse perspectives because they see that those are being valued. Absolutely. And I think one of the things you spoke about is the work that the ACGME is doing in terms of pathways for recruitment and retention. And so this kind of diversifies the workforce. So what I want us to kind of move towards is the distinction between cultural humility and how that differs from cultural competence. And I think those two terms sometimes use interchangeably. And so um, can one of our panelists really kind of really discuss the differences in those two kind of distinctions? I know Dr. Ortega has done a lot of work in that, so I want to defer to some of her comments, but I will say this. So if you actually have to look at the history of these terms, and I, I think cultural competence actually emerged as a uh, an active term about 25 years ago. Uh, and it was really a positive thing in, certain, in terms of seeing uh, physicians were basically too Eurocentric and that one needed to be culturally competent. But it also suggested that you could read a book and become, you know, versed in Chinese culture, for example. And we know that was a mistake. I have a colleague, Dr. Melanie Turvalon, who was actually the pioneer that coined the term um, cultural humility, and I think she reset our thinking that it wasn't about reading a book. It was actually an active journey, an active commitment, an active sense of where we are from and where we need to go, as opposed to just saying it's something you can read in an encyclopedia. But I'm sure Dr. Ortega has some other comments along that line. I think that's exactly right, uh, Dr. Wong. And I, I think one of the, um, the things that I would add to that is that I think we probably need both, right? Um, I think the pendulum has swung over time in terms of it used to be all the I think Dr. Ortega got frozen a little bit. And uh, while she uh, comes back, I will just uh, sort of emphasize an important point. Need. Was share. Oops, sorry, Dr. Ortega, we had lost you for for oh. a little bit. So welcome back. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Can you uh, let me try turning off my video for a second here? Um, so uh, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, my uh, the main point that I wanted to to add to this is that although the pendulum has swung in terms of whether um, it, the right term to use is cultural competence or the right thing to aim for is cultural competence versus cultural humility, the reality it's a both and. So we need to be able to do both. We need to, um, there are some skills and behaviors that are concrete and we can learn uh, to do correctly and re in order to have respectful and um, accurate communication with groups of patients. And we have to recognize that those strategies are not gonna work for everyone and, and we need to be able to follow the patient and we need to recognize our own biases. And that's the part that's cultural humility. So I, I really think both are important, but the, the absolutely Dr. Wang's um, comments are, are spot on in terms of the difference between the two. And I, if I may add uh, briefly, um, you know, these are two terms and there's a whole lot of different terms that are very important, very impactful and very timely also to bring into a similar conversations. Um, you know, a good example is the conversation about anti-racism. Um, Kandi uh, talks about also um, a developmental phase of uh, 
anti-racism uh, actions. And uh, other folks, uh, Smith and others have talked about a cultural proficiency continuum that matches kind of like development, like psychological developmental defenses that people use at various stages along the way and different aspects of how we behave from a very destructive uh, uh, way into a very sort of integrative and supportive uh, approach to really uh, functioning uh, transculturally. And so there's uh, there's the importance uh, that this brings up is we grow with that. It's not a static, it's a process and we must want to aspire not to be in that end of the spectrum necessarily, but to keep moving ourselves along that growth path uh, where we can become a little bit more humble and a little bit uh, more proficient um, in 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 that uh, uh, ladder. Thank you so much, Dr. Moreno. Um, I think you know one of the things we we must discuss as a social determinant of health is language barriers. So. You know, I posed this question to Dr. Ortega. Are there opportunities for faculty to implement a focus on understanding languages of communities that may serve, such as medical Spanish, in the medical curriculum? Yes, absolutely. So uh, language is really a key element within culture, right? It's for, for those of us who are um, confident in communicating in the dominant culture around us, we almost don't even think about it because um, language is so, so basic. But um, for those who um, have differences in their language preference, by which I mean the language in which people best communicate about their health, um, then they notice it all the time. And that's pretty much all they notice in terms of, am I going to be able to communicate with the doctor today? Am I going to be able to, if I call this clinic, am I going to be able to make the appointment? Am I going to be able to ask my question? Am I going to be able to understand? So we cannot ignore, as you said, Dr. St. John, the issue of language. Um, in fact, in the United States, one out of every five persons, adults, um, has a language preference other than English or speaks a language other than English at home. So it's actually something that affects so many people um, in the country. And we know that a lot of students actually come in with language skills that whether we train them or not, they will be using with patient care. So I think that's the other thing is that if we choose to ignore this, it our students are potentially going to be physicians who are going to be using those languages anyway, but they will not be necessarily prepared in the skills of accurately self-assessing their skills as well as their limitations of working effectively with medical interpreters and partnering with teams in order to provide the best possible care. So medical Spanish in particular has proliferated, as you know, in the United States and uh, almost 80% of medical schools in the most recent survey responded that they offer some form of medical Spanish education. What's really important is, um, is understanding the nuances of that because not in all cases were medical Spanish courses taught by faculty, not in all cases do they include assessment, not in all cases are they a uh, formal part of the curriculum, um, and, uh, and not in all cases do institutions officially provide students with course credit. So all of these elements are pieces that are really important if for any course that we have in a medical school, and we shouldn't have a different standard for a course that is preparing our students to take care of populations that are marginalized linguistically, whether it be because they speak Spanish or any other language. Um, so there is a growing, you know, ba evidence base for how to do this um, uh, properly, and and uh, and that there's also a lot of ongoing research in this space. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortega. You know, I have to say. Uh, greater than 20 years ago, I was one of those medical schools. I attended one of those medical schools that we, in fact, had medical Spanish, which was very different from the Spanish we had at home. So um, I was happy that I was able to have that access to that type of curriculum because it helped me relate to my patients better. But using a 
the proper terminology. Um, you know, one of the things Dr. Wong said during his presentation is that we have to change the navigation across healthcare delivery systems to be more patient centered. And I think starting with leveling the 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 playing field of language is one of those kind of bedrocks that we have to build upon. So thank you for that. I think we have time for just one more question. I just wanna make sure that's okay. Um, and this will be for Dr. Moreno. Um, what is the importance of having faculty that represent medical students and their backgrounds? And what may be some of the challenges associated with a limited workforce um, demographically? And how does that relate to direct patient care outcomes? Dr. Moreno, will you, you just answer that question and close us out, please? Okay, thank you very much. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, you know, the importance of faculty is always essential. Uh, we spoke about the need for um, providing services to individuals from multiple backgrounds, the uh, importance of culturally and linguistic uh, congruence between the providers and the recipients of care. Um, you know, in, in uh, the Hispanic community, uh, the understanding of the culture and the use of Spanish is essential. I'm a psychiatrist in my specialty. It doesn't get much more um, obvious than that. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I think uh, Dr. Ortega already talked a little bit about the importance of education. And I'll just highlight the aspect of research. Um, we are staying out of participating in the development of evidence and new knowledge if we are excluding individuals who are not able to speak English um, with enough proficiency to uh, participate in the informed consent process and the rating skills and everything else that takes place in those places. So um, I think having researchers that are also able to speak the language, equipping ourselves with team members who are able to speak the language, uh, it's one of those tools that will also allow us to bring faculty to contribute in ways other than the clinical care, the education, uh, but also the development of new knowledge that can help us address the needs of communities that are often um, excluded. So thank you for that opportunity again. And with that, I'll bring my comments to a close and uh, thank all my colleagues for their contributions also. So firstly, I would like to thank our guest speakers for their time and expertise on today's topic, as well as our live audience for participating today. A recording of today's discussion will be added onto the National Hispanic Medical Association YouTube channel um, and their page and their website within a week. We hope that everyone enjoyed our informative conversation. Please join us for our upcoming events. But also, if you have any questions regarding the National Hispanic Medical Association's efforts towards increasing cultural competence education in medical schools, please reach out to our program manager, Jason Hernandez. Thank you all again and enjoy the rest of your day.